Hello, thank you all for joining us today. I'm Chris Corey, Superintendent of the Fairfield Bethune Unified School District. One month ago, our staff convened to answer your questions on reopening of schools. And at that time, we were planning for in-person reopening as we would adhere to our safety precautions to minimize the risk to our students and staff. Less than one week ago, Governor Newsom put out a mandate in regard to reopening schools. And this past Monday, our governing board took action to reopen schools on August 19th in phase one of our reopening continuum, which is 100% distance learning. We know that while many people are very pleased with this decision to open via distance learning, others are disappointed by this mandate. The safety and the security of our staff, students, and community is of utmost importance. COVID-19 is not going away anytime soon, and we all need to work together to mitigate the transmission to the best of our ability. We are so grateful today to have Solano County Health Officer Deputy Direct Director Dr. Bella Machas with us today to answer some of your questions, particularly those that address the health and safety of our students, staff, and our community. I also want to express my sincere appreciation to our hardworking staff who continue to adjust and react to the many changes that happen from one day to the next. We hope to answer the majority of your questions that you submitted today, and if, unfortunately, due to time constraints, we are unable to do so, please don't hesitate to reach out to staff via email or give us a call, and we will um, direct your questions to the appropriate staff member to answer. I'm now going to turn this uh, over to Tim Gorey, our Executive Director of Administrative Services and Community Engagement, as he will be facilitating our discussions today. Thank you, Superintendent Corey. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Dr. Matthias, for joining us. Out of respect for your time, we want to push the questions that we have um, that are specifically for you or involve you up to the front of this question and answer session. And so uh, we'll start right off uh, with the first question. Uh, can students meet teachers even at a distance prior to the first day of school? In terms of, if, if the question is asking, is it safe to do so or can it be done safely? The answer is yes, definitely. Um, as to purpose, that would be up to you as to why that would happen. But yeah, it's, it's important to maintain social distancing in all encounters. So if there is a, an interaction and people are standing six feet apart, they're wearing face coverings, then there's really no genuine risk whatsoever of transmission. Just want to make sure that we have the microphone on for Dr. Machias. Is that, can Is you hear him? Working? Okay, good. Just want to make sure that that's the case. Great. Does anybody else uh, want to chime in on, on the possibility of allowing um, teachers to meet with students individually before school? To, to and I think we've them. received this question both from um, teachers and from parents. And the concern is that when we went into distance learning in the spring, those relationships had already been established with the teachers. And so they were able to continue fostering those relationships online. And so there is um, some thought, and if there was an ability, even in a small group or individually, to be able to connect with students um, before schools build those relationships first. And if I could just add, because I think that it also makes sense in conjunction with processes and procedures that we're going to need to be um, developing and pushing out regarding families being able to pick up the necessary instructional materials in order to support the students learning during the course of the year. And so it seems like there's a way that we can combine those different activities, especially knowing that it's safe for the staff and the students, so that um, our staff can meet our students and our students can receive the instructional materials necessary in order to um, engage in distance learning this year. Thank you. Um, Dr. Machis, uh, who pays for COVID-19 testing when somebody is exposed at school? Well, it, it depends on whether you have health insurance or not. If you go to your health care provider, it's, it's like any other health care procedure. So it's paid for by your insurance, but you have co-pays and deductibles. Um, if it is a person without health insurance, then they would need to be tested in a different situation. They might be tested in an emergency room, or they might be tested at one of the freestanding optum service sites that do testing, and those are all free. 
So there shouldn't be a copay or deductible. I mean, the idea is to provide the test for free for everyone. But in terms of who actually pays, it's always going to come down to us through taxes to the federal government or insurance. So that's sort of the philosophical answer. The practical answer is it should always be free. Thank you. And what criteria get Solano County off of the state's watch list so that we can open again? So there are, um, there are about a half dozen metrics that are being followed on the report card by the state for every county. In Solano, there are three of those that we are not doing uh, well enough on, according to the governor, to be able to come off the list. Those three are the rate of illness. We have a high rate of illness. It's above the 25 per um, thousand level of illness that they are willing to accept. We also have a uh, percentage of positives that is too high. The threshold is 8%. We are above that. And the other uh, metric, the one that got us on in the first place, is an increase in hospitalizations. So you need to demonstrate that hospitalizations are static or decreasing, not increasing. So the only good news on that is that it went up so high that as long as it doesn't get worse, we're going to come off the list for that because the increases, um, it's, it's not increasing. It's, you know, it's bouncing between high 40s and low 50s, but it's within their range. Um, but we have to demonstrate that for a sustained period before we come off. And the other two metrics, we have no control over. Um, as long as people are continuing to transmit illness, the disease rate and the positivity rate are, are beyond our control. Even the hospitalization is not in our control because it, it has to do with who gets sick and who needs hospitalization. Um, and some of the hospitalized cases in our county are, for example, San Quentin uh, prisoners that are, are uh, yeah, San Quentin prisoners who've been transferred. Um, some of them are individuals who are hospitalized from assisted care or a, a nursing home, and then they're refusing to take them back. And so that's sort of a, an issue we have to tackle with the nursing homes and the assisted care facilities. So there is a bit of an artificial increase in hospitalizations right now because of those other factors. Um, the hospitalization is not the one I'm worried about. It's the other two that I, I don't I don't see any time in the near future a reduction in disease rates or in positivity. Um, this is being experienced throughout the country. It's certainly not unique to our county. So it needs to uh, all of those parameters have to be within the acceptable ranges for a prolonged period of time for three weeks. Then we come off the list, and then um, in theory, schools would then be permitted to resume face to face. Anything to add to that? <laughs> well, we had this conversation, I think, last Friday after the governor announced, and um, it's pretty difficult. The, the interesting part about this mandate is if we were in a county that wasn't on the watch list, and then they went onto the watch list, that they won't have to go distance learning. Right. It's just that we are there right now, and so that mandate applies to us. and so it, it appears from you know what we've got our conversations that we're going to be in distance learning for a long period of time because even the criteria to get off let's be, say we get off the watch list then there has to be 14 days of um, this average of keeping us off and so it it just seems unreasonable that we're going to get off anytime soon as it said. I think if we ask ourselves why we're here in the first place the answer is that people since about Mother's Day, have been in their personal lives having family and social gatherings on the weekends at home or at their family's home or friend's home, not doing any social distance. I can't tell you how many hundreds and hundreds of cases we've had from that situation. Fourth of July was the most recent big bump, not surprising, but it's not abating. If you go around any community on the weekend, you see parties everywhere. And as long as people keep engaging in that type of behavior, we will continue to see cases. And there's just nothing that's going to change that. And I think normal human behavior for the summer involves a lot of get-togethers. And in the fall, typically, if, because of the resumption of school, that diminishes. But if school doesn't resume, if you're no different in September than you are in July, then what's the, what's the, the driver to reduce social interaction? So I'm actually quite concerned that this will continue all the way into the holiday season and through. And until we experience the opportunity to have a uh, vaccination, you know, which, which then can help, I think, ameliorate some of the risk of transmission, until we're there, if people don't change that behavior, then the disease rates have no reason to go down because that's what's driving it. You know, I think you ask the average person, I think the average person feels that their biggest risk is going to the grocery store or going to a, 
a business or something like that, and that's where they're likely to get exposed. And that's, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Those incidental exposures have to date demonstrated no transmission whatsoever. We've had no outbreaks due to hairdressers, no outbreaks due to um, the bars, no outbreaks due to restaurants, nothing of that sort in our county. Everything that we've seen, all the outbreaks are either workplace outbreaks, of which there have been quite a few, but they're typically pretty small, um, or much more commonly family outbreaks, outbreaks with people in these gatherings. So these 4th of July barbecues, you know, we're getting 10 and 15 cases among 40 or 50 people got together. And then they're bringing it into the workplace, and then everybody in the workplace gets all upset because they think about the workplace transmission, but there isn't ever, I shouldn't say ever, it's certainly theoretically possible, but we have not observed workplace transmission from these cases. It's just in their own families. So the issue here is this dichotomy of what is really happening versus what people perceive to be the risk. And until people actually appreciate where the risk is, it's going to be very hard to do anything to curtail the outcome. I think it's very easy for all of us to believe that we're safe with our family and friends. But the truth is, that's where the diseases like COVID are transmitted, not in the incidental exposures. That is really helpful information. I know for me, um, to have that detail really helps me understand a little bit better how I might act in order to, to make the situation better. Well, and if I can add to that, we are, not, we are not proposing that people not have interactions with family and friends. We're proposing that when you do it, do it with social distancing in mind. Stand six feet apart. Don't share food. Don't share cigarettes and things like that. That's, you know, that's saliva transmission. That's COVID being transmitted. Uh, don't stand face to face. Avoid embracing if you can do it. So, and also, if you're going to have a party, don't, don't bring the elders. Because our fatalities over the last three weeks have been elders attending birthday parties and graduation parties, and barbecues, and had they not been invited, their lives would have been spared. So if you just think about what you can do to still have the interaction but reduce the risk of transmission, you can, you can engage in those behaviors much more safely. And this next question from our community members kind of has two different bents to it. The question is, will COVID testing be required? to return to school. There's really two different situations that this question was asked in. One was, is everybody going to have to be tested uh, negative in order to come to school the first time when we open back up? The second piece is, if somebody's out uh, because they're sick um, of school when school is open, do they need to be tested negative for COVID before they So there's two answers. The first is, what will I require? And the other is, what would a politician force me to do beyond what I consider to be appropriate. Um, what I would require is, no, absolutely not. I think it is absolutely inappropriate to test everyone before return for many reasons. The first is it's an incredible waste of testing resources used in the wrong way. Secondly, much more importantly, it reinforces the, the myth around testing that so many people have. If you test negative today, you can convert tomorrow. Testing negative today and then saying, oh, everybody's clear, everybody's safe, is, is not an honest interpretation. So if you test all your kids and all your faculty on a Saturday, they resume school on Monday, you're going to have emergence of cases that next week and the week after because the incubation period is 14 days. So there's just no guarantee that negative means anything beyond the day that you took the test. Also, as a practical reality, it'll take you about two weeks just to get the test and then two more weeks to get the results. So you're on, you know, if you require that, you're automatically delaying everything by four weeks because the, the commercial testing sector is so overwhelmed right now, there is just no way to get rapid results to turn around. And then the result you have is now a month old and it's completely used. So the, to, from my standpoint, there is, it is such an irrational thing to do and it has so little value that I would absolutely argue against it. As for a child who is out sick or uh, um, faculty or staff that are out sick, if they have symptoms consistent with COVID, they should be tested and healthcare will test them and then you'll have a result and you'll know. But the good news is that if their illness is caused by COVID, they only have to stay away for 10 days with or without a test because after 10 days, they're no longer infectious and they can return and, and they pose no risk whatsoever to the environment. So it doesn't require testing. Um, but I think that with all the pressure to test that's happening right now, they probably will get tested, you know, and then um, you'll have they'll have knowledge, you won't, because it's not really appropriate for you to know about their result, but they'll have knowledge about whether they were positive or not. But again, it doesn't change anything because I'm gonna require the same isolation period with or without a test. It's still gonna be the assumption that they have COVID and therefore a 10 day isolation before they can return. 
Now, having said all of that, um, I have no idea what, what will happen when face-to-face -face resumes because um, there is a lot of pressure for testing out there, and I can totally see politicians like the governor, for example, dictating that that has to happen. So I don't want to say it won't because I might easily be made a liar by them, but I can say that it is a completely non-rational thing to do. Well, you can probably tell I have no opinion on it. <laughs> can I ask a question? So, for the longest time, we've been hearing 14 days, and I know just recently I read days about is 10. Quarantine. Did, okay, can so, you so think that? about how the, how the virus works. You are exposed to the virus. From the day that you are exposed, there can be between 2 and 14 days in which you develop the illness. So, if you want to be away from people when you become sick, you are quarantined for 14 days. That 14-day window has to do with how long does it take to develop illness from the virus. On any one of those days when you become sick, you have 10 days in which you spread the virus. So your infectious period is 10 days. So if I am a case, I am isolated for 10 days. If I'm a contact and have not yet become a case, I am quarantined for 14 days. So those are the two time periods we talk about, and it's important not to intermix them because they mean very different things. One is, what is the period of concern that you may become infectious? The other is, how long are you infected? And just to be um, completely transparent, there are sort of two windows we work with for infectious. One is 10 days, which is almost everybody, but for people who are severely immunocompromised or are severely ill, it's 20 days. Because their body's immune system is not strong enough to stop the infectiousness as quickly, um, when I say 10 days, the literature clearly shows that after about six days, there's virtually no transmission. And when I say 20 days, pretty much after 12 days, there's no transmission. But the CDC and the state want to use round numbers because it's easier to implement, and they want to be conservative. So you'll hear the 10 days for the infectious window, but realistically, if you came back at day seven or eight, you're not infectious anymore, but, but that's not okay. We're still going to go with 10 days. And the 14 days has to do with you're not out of the woods for 14 days. But here's the problem. Most people who are infectious are asymptomatic. So you won't even know that you converted to positive in those 14 days. So if you work in a high-risk environment, for example, you work in a skilled nursing facility or at the jail, we actually require that you be tested on the 14th day before you return. Because we want to know that you didn't become infectious during those 14 days. So you're quarantined for 14 days. And, you, and if you develop symptoms, we test you right away to see, are you now positive? Um, if you don't develop symptoms and you're in a high-risk environment, we still want you tested on day 14 to make sure you didn't become positive before you go into a high-risk environment. Um, but that, the, schools would not be considered a high-risk environment. Commercial is not high-risk. The only high-risk environments are the ones with um, severely fragile elderly. So it's the skilled nursing facilities, memory care, um, and then jails and prison because of the, the forced congregate nature of those environments. Does that all make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it, and very helpful, too, to, to understand the difference between those. Thank you. Um, a couple of loaded questions coming up here, but many of our community members and parents asked, and so we felt it was important to, to get your take, at least, on, on these questions. One is, what is a bigger risk for children, uh, COVID-19 or the mental and emotional health challenges of not attending school? I have to give a couple of background answers before I can answer that question. The first is the concept of risk. Um, I think many people equate risk with hazard. In fact, that's not at all true. Risk is your perception of risk. That's what the concept represents. And th that has no correlation with the actual hazard. So as an example, something that's classically used in risk communication teaching is if you live next to a chemical plant, most people think that the risk from the plant is extremely high whereas the actual hazard is incredibly low. Same with nuclear power plants. So we don't want to live near them because we fear them. And fear, in turn, engenders a perception of risk that is much different from the actual hazard. And there have been multiple studies dating back to the 1970s that show that there is no correlation between your perception of risk and the actual hazard. And so I want to be really careful in answering that question, that a person's perception of the risk of COVID if they are fearful, if it's because it's unknown, if, you know, if they are, are concerned about it for, um, based on what they're hearing in the media, and et cetera, they may actually value that risk as being far greater than the alternate harm to the child, 
of reduced socialization, reduced interaction with with face-to-face -face teaching, which may be a far superior means, uh, the increased risk of child abuse. But if you look at the hazard, the number of humans harmed, the hazard of not returning for those students is far, far greater than the hazard of returning. But that's not the important question, because we don't make decisions based on hazard. I do, because that's my job, but most people don't. Most people make their decisions based on risk. So answering that question is almost, is almost futile, because a parent who's fearful isn't going to care about that answer. Um, but I do think we have to own, as a culture, as a society, what we are doing to our children by not having education operate as, as we need it to. Um, we, have, we have seen and are continuing to see extraordinary increases in child abuse and, and domestic abuse. We are seeing substantial mental health impacts on these young children, especially for those with learning disabilities, for whom the absence of face-to-face -face is especially problematic. Um, and as a consequence of isolation of children, what we are seeing is the reason for the spread, which is party. So people have basically said, yeah, this isn't okay for my kids. I need, they need to see their friends. They can't be isolated at home. So they're doing the very wrong thing, you know, the thing that we don't want, which is to, to stay away from, from each other, and they're not, and they're spreading the disease. We've already had nearly 300 school children in our county positive for COVID just in the last couple of years. Well, school's been closed. Where are they getting it? They're getting it from each other playing. Kids play with each other outside of school. They play with each other inside of school. Once you get beyond about the age of six or seven, you have a click in all likelihood. And those are the people you interact with inside and outside. And it doesn't change it. So it's, it's actually a myth to believe that school is more dangerous for those kids than home because they're not changing their social patterns of behavior outside of the school. We've also had a couple hundred teachers positive. How is that possible if they're not exposed to students? Well, because they're partying too. And I'm not denigrating it. I'm not judging that partying is bad. Social interactions are core to who we are as it is completely necessary to have it. And, and we do the best we can to be safe, but we nonetheless engage in those behaviors. And you can try to social distance with parties for adults, but forget it for kids. It's just not going to happen. So I think if we're honest with ourselves, um, there are harms of what we are doing, and there are harms we are trying to avoid. If you ask me, who is just looking at numbers, the harms that are caused by not opening school are numerically greater than the harms caused by opening school. But that does not relate to risk. Well, I hope you don't have a copyright on that answer, because I'm going to be stealing it. Uh, by all means. <laughs> that, was, that was incredible. Thank you so much. And the next question is a puzzle for a lot of our community members. Why is it that daycares are allowed to be open, but schools aren't? Daycares and schools were both considered essential. Daycares typically are run by individual proprietors. It's a business. They operate a business. So like every other essential business, they had an incentive to remain open, but they had to modify their, their approach. Schools are not. Schools are, uh, especially public schools, are basically the, the com combination of, of all of you and your board and your community. And so there is a societal oversight of schools that doesn't exist for daycares, a community oversight, and it was the community that wanted schools closed. And schools also have a common oversight by the California Department of Education. So when the decision was made to close schools by CDE, all the schools closed. But there is no comparable oversight of daycare. And so from my perspective, what it represents is just that there are different drivers for opening and closing those facilities. They, neither one was more dangerous than the other. If you see a, a, an irony, you should, because there's actually a greater per person risk of transmission in a daycare than there is in a school. Um, but we've also seen no daycare out. We've had lots of positive daycare instructors, and you know, then we have to shut down that particular cohort. But it has a lot to do with the fact that most kids are asymptomatic, so we're not going to see it anyway, even if they are spreading. Uh, so I'm not saying there isn't transmission in daycares. There may very well be. But the way that they've been constructed with cohorts is that we limit the size of that cluster to the size of the cohort. So that, you know, that basically there's an, an understanding that if one person's sick, you're probably all going to get it in that group, but at least you're not spreading it to all the other groups because the groups are operating separately. And that's harder as a model to implement in the school. The other problem with, with the other difference is daycare has a, pretty much a single model of, of operation, and schools are so complex. You're doing so many different things that you don't have one model of operation. So you would have to entertain the risks of all of those um, elements in order to have a comprehensive solution for school, which isn't true for daycare. Thank you. 
Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of questions that some of the people uh, may be seeing on their spreadsheet and come back to them in just a moment. But I want to move uh, to a question uh, that's really about process. Should somebody be uh, tested positive and schools are open? So when schools are open, um, we've got students, maybe even uh, staff that are at, at schools, um, but students maybe not, not even in schools, and somebody tests positive. What is the process that the county uh, will go through to help us determine what to do next? It's always a two-step process. And for those of you who, who have had um, cases of pertussis or meningococcal disease or measles, you know what the process is. It's always the same process. The details differ because the diseases differ, but the process is always the same. The case, the individual who is ill, is investigated. And we learn from that investigation where they were when they were infectious, could were they in school? In other words, um, when you know the onset date of illness, you then know the infectious period. So we identify where were they when they were infectious, and we identify all the locations that they were at when they were infectious. And for each one, we work with the case to identify who their close contacts are. So here's where it differs. In the case of measles, the entire classroom would be a close contact, it's airborne. In the case of tuberculosis, you know, people within 20 feet would probably be considered a close contact. For COVID, it's people within six feet for 15 minutes or more, unprotected. So sitting as we are here, if one of us were to become a case, none of us is a contact because we're protected, plus we're physically pretty distant. But if you're in each other's space, you're within six feet of one another, you're not wearing a mask, and you're doing that for 15 minutes or longer, you are by definition a close contact. So we identify the contacts in that case investigation, and then we work with the contact to make sure that they are quarantined. Remember the 14-day period, that they're quarantined and that they're tested so that we can have a sense of understanding of whether they have already trans become cases or whether they can go through their quarantine and not. You will not be told the identity of a positive because HIPAA prohibits me from telling you. What you may notice is that some people don't show up to work for, for 10 days or 14 days, depending on whether they're a case or a contact. Um, and so we will rigorously identify the contact and, uh, and what we do is use that droplet precaution parameter, which is six feet of distance or closer with, uh, for 15 minutes duration or longer with no protection. So that means that for that case, they went to the grocery store, they went to, the, you know, to uh, various retail outlets or whatever, none of the people there would be a, a contact. They go to their dentist, the dentist is a contact because you know, you're not gonna be wearing your mask and you're gonna be within six feet for a prolonged period of time. Coworkers, if people are following social distancing, there are, shouldn't be any coworker contact. Your staff and faculty should not expose any other staff or faculty, or they violated your instructions on social distance. But people do, and if they do, then we identify those folks and they become contact. So it's, it's a case investigation followed by contact tracing, and then um, all the potential individuals are identified and dealt with. But I will note, here's the problem we're dealing with today. It is taking so long to get results back that by the time I can do a case investigation, that person may be way beyond their infection. So they won't actually have to do any time away because they're no longer infectious by the time I even know about them. And none of their contacts can be prevented from getting exposed because there wasn't enough time to do it. So one of the, the serious downsides of all the testing that's happening right now is that the backlogs at the commercial laboratories are rendering contact tracing useless. We're talking about this all the time in the media and, you know, with the governor and the state about how important it is, et cetera, et cetera. But on the front lines, I can tell you it's an absolute impossibility to do it in a timely manner because I can't do contact tracing if, if there's a 21-day delay from the time the person was sick and tested till the time I get a result. And, um, and unfortunately, the average right now is 10 days. You know, and we're getting um, over 100 cases a day. By the time we can actually do the contact investigation, we're hardly quarantining anybody because they're already through their quarantine. Now we're recommending testing for all of them, right? The contacts so that we can at least learn if it went to another generation of spread. And, and I cannot promise that if you resume face-to-face -face school that we won't have that same reality. If we still have an overburden on the testing, we're still gonna have that. So there'll be actually nothing asked to the school in terms of any of this, unless the reporter, the case, is unable to give us information. Sometimes people are hospitalized, they're in the ICU and we can't get an interview. Then we'll circle back to you um, because you will have direct knowledge of that faculty or student and who their close contacts were. And so we'll, unfortunately at that point, we'll have to divulge identity and we'll work with you to identify who the contacts 
I think that's probably one of the hardest things for people to understand too is just the confidentiality in all of this. Because what yeah. they'd like to know is if I'm working in a workspace with somebody and they have it, isn't it my right to know that they have it so that I can take action? And the answer is definitely no. It's not your right to have that information. And it's no for a, a, a lot of reasons. One, it's none of your business, unless it's your business, and I'll make sure you know if it is. That's my job is to help out. The other much more important issue is if you're not taking care to do social distancing until the disease is in your space, you already lost. There's no way that you're doing the right thing if you need to know about a positive cohort. You should have complete confidence that you're taking care of yourself properly, and then you never have to worry. It's an irrelevant concept to worry about the, to have that knowledge if you're doing the right thing. And so I use that as a teachable moment, which is like, you know, I think it's really sad that you only care when it's too late. Because frankly, if you're a contact, it's too late. You know, you've been exposed. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get sick. But it does mean that you didn't take advantage of the opportunity to protect. Thank you. Uh, if and when we reopen campuses, can playgrounds and particularly play equipment be used? And if so, how often would they need to be managed? I believe the answer to that's not going to barely be in our control. I, I'm quite certain that that's going to be dictated by the state. And so, you know, we'll simply have to follow what they are, um, what they are recommending. From the standpoint of the, of the risk of transmission of the virus, if you've got 20 people, 20 kids playing in a playground, the chance of transmission from them hugging each other, spinning each other's face, interacting as kids do with each other is thousands fold greater than getting it off of a surface. Cleaning the playground equipment is an absolute waste of time from a disease transmission standpoint. It is, however, goes back to this issue of, of hazard versus risk. People assume it needs to be done. So if you don't do it, people are going are gonna to accuse you of not taking care of people properly. Like all these deep cleaning things that people do, absolute waste of money and time. But an absolute necessity if you are demonstrating to the community that you're doing everything in your power to protect. Because the, the mythology in the community is that the surface transmission is important. In point of fact, it's not. I've yet to find, I mean, I, I have no choice but to peruse the literature constantly. There's not been a single cluster or outbreak related to surface transmission or airborne transmission. Everything can be explained by droplet-borne transmission. Um, but that's not what people believe. I think if you ask your, your friends and, and, and you know, other people that you interact with, they're going to say airborne is really important, and they're going to assume surface. So therein lies the underlying problem, which is that risk is determined by that, not by the actual hazard. And so you'll probably have to figure out a way to clean the equipment and you know, go through tons of cleaning agents, which will probably expose the kids to toxic materials in addition to the virus. I just have a follow-up because another um, concern has been water fountains. So does water, is there a risk to the water fountains? There's and not a risk of the water itself, but there is a risk of the water fountain for all respiratory mm -hmm. diseases. Because if you put your saliva onto the spout, that saliva is available to be exposing mm -hmm. the next person. That's actually a legitimate risk. What you need to do, if you want to know where the virus goes, follow your saliva because it's in the respiratory secretion. You cough, you sneeze, you, you spit when you talk, you're, you, you touch your mouth, touch a surface. Where the saliva goes is where the virus goes. So the problem with a water fountain is most people don't drink properly. Um, should all students and staff be temperature checked at school every day? And if not, why not? At this point, we know with quite some certainty that less than 1% of cases develop fever. So if you're doing the temperature check as a way of finding cases, it is an utter waste of time. Uh, we also know that for every um, person with a fever, even now, for every person with a fever due to COVID, there's 100 people with a fever not due to COVID. So you're also mislabeling almost everybody you find. So when you put those two pieces together, it's hard for me to defend it as an intelligent thing to do. But it is still done in many places. And, you know, I mean, at the airport, they temperature screen you. I mean, all this, all this stuff is based on what we thought we knew in January. And here we are in July. We actually know a lot more. And I would argue that there is, that there is no value to that at all. There is genuine value in self-screening. I mean, people should not come into school if they're sick, period. And so if you have a fever, you should not be here. And you're, it, you're not going to reach the 101.4 without feeling it. 
So, you know, you're going to feel warm. You might even feel, frankly, feverish. It depends on what temperature you typically run. But that is so hot, so much higher than baseline temperature that you're going to know you have a fever. So you don't need to take a temperature to know that. And then you, you, you should also not be coming if you have a cough, you know, if you've got coughing, sneezing, you know, the, the symptoms that we talk about, shortness of breath, et cetera, you need to self-screen and not come into the school environment or you're exposing people inappropriately to something. It doesn't even have to be COVID. You're exposing people to something you shouldn't be exposing. Them. So the added value of temperature screening, the problem with that is it creates a false liability um, because you believe you're actually protecting people by taking the temperature. And I guarantee that for every one you find, 99 will come through that you didn't find. And then you'll be liable for a bad system. So these next three questions, I think, are all related. So I'm going to just ask them all um, in a row. And my guess is your answer is going to be pretty much the same for all of them. But maybe I'll, maybe I'll be wrong. The first question is, how, how do you protect other students from a student who has not shown any apparent systems, uh, symptoms but still has the virus? The second question is, what safety precautions are most important to mitigate the spread of COVID-19? And the third question is, what about staff rooms, cafeterias, large gathering spaces? What are the safety precautions that we should ensure in these areas? So good news, bad news. The good news is that if you follow proper social distancing, and when I say social distancing, I'm not just talking about physical distancing, I'm not just six feet, it's also hand washing, uh, cough etiquette, staying home when you're sick. It, it includes using hand sanitizer. It includes being physically apart. And it includes using a mask where appropriate, right? If you're doing that combination of measures or taking that combination of measures, you are sufficiently protecting yourself from others and others from you. So there is an exception. If I'm floridly sick and I'm coughing and sneezing really badly, this is not going to protect people around me because I'm going to cough through the mask enough to put them at risk. But if I'm asymptomatic and I'm a spit talker or it's coming out in my breath, if you believe in that sort of thing, this is stopping it. And if you're doing it, this is stopping it from you. So the good thing about following social distancing rigorously is that it, it means that asymptomatic transmission is not an issue. The, um, the problem, the bad news, is you can enforce that much more easily with older people than younger people. There comes a point in age where you just realistically can't enforce it. And I don't know what that age cutoff is. I mean, obviously, children vary in their level of maturity. Some, some five-year-olds are probably better than some adults, and some 18-year-olds might as well be five. And, and there's just, you know, the, the thing is, you know your, you know your population. But my, my point is that properly practiced social distancing actually is the best protection universally against transmission, particularly from asymptomatic transmission. Um, but the degree to which you can employ that, those measures and enforce them is, is going to govern how effective they are. And you might be fine in middle school and high school. I don't know how practical it is through all the grades of primary. You know, so I, I, kind, of, I kind of feel like that's definitely your call more than, more than anybody else's. But yes, that will amply protect. One of the things that we talked about early on is um, Oh, it just doesn't seem possible that so something so simple like hand washing, wearing a mask, and staying you know, uh, social distance apart could have such a huge impact because it just seems like that's too simple of an answer. It does, and it's the same thing we've been talking to you about your whole life. I mean, when did your didn't your parents say this to you when you were growing up? I mean, this is something we've known for two hundred years, yeah, and. The beauty of it is it, it not only protects you from COVID, it protects you from every respiratory pathogen. And, um, and there are a lot of other ones out there that are bad too. They may, not be as, as, um, they may not be as novel or as common or as widespread as COVID is right now, but there are many dangerous respiratory pathogens in our communities all the time. And social distancing protects you against all of them. So if it's a habit you can adopt, it's a habit that protects you for the duration of your life. But you're right, I think part of, part of the problem is it's too simple. People maybe assume that it's therefore, and I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know how to address. It. Can I ask a follow-up question on the physical distancing piece of it as it relates to school? Because in some of the readings I've heard, especially at the lower grade levels, that it's three feet between students, and then a six, six feet from students to, to a staff member. Is there anything to that in terms, or is everything six feet, or how does that part work? 
there's nothing to that that's based in science. It's based in practicality. It, the real issue here is that the most vulnerable in your community are your teachers and staff, right? Deaths among children have occurred, but they are incredibly rare. The deaths occur primarily in people over the age of 65 with significant underlying health issues. In our county, we've had 35 fatalities. 84% 80, are in people over the age of 65. Almost every one of them, with one exception, had very serious underlying health issues. And so we know that that combination is just much more likely in an adult than in a child. And so if the adults practice six-foot distancing from the children, then they are the most vulnerable. They are best protected. The children, you know, even if you believe that they're going to adhere to your instructions, and I just don't know how anyone can believe that, but let's say, like, if you've never had kids, you have no idea what a kid is, and you believed that, um, then the other, the other reality is that they're still going to get together at home. So they're not spreading it in the school environment. They're still going to spread it at home. It, it doesn't change. The good news is that they're mostly going to be healthy or mostly asymptomatic. I mean, most of those cases will never come to anyone's attention because they're just asymptomatic. So it, it, if what your goal is is mitigation, if your goal is to reduce the harm of a disease in our community, you want to protect the adults. And they, they can maintain rigorous social distancing with or without the kids maintaining rigorous social distancing. The point of three feet versus four versus six is just how many chairs you can put in a classroom. And, um, and, and the, the, the scientific simple fact is that it probably doesn't matter because you're going to get clusters among kids. You're not going to see it. It's going to happen anyway. And it's probably going to happen with or without school being open. I mean, like I said, we've already had 300 school children that are positive. And, you know, schools aren't open. Um, and, and so if your focus is on mitigation and the creation of negligible risk, you can entertain really any distance between the kids, but it's got to be rigorous with the adults. And, you know, in the younger grades where children um, are much more physically interactive with the teachers as well, you may want to supplement that with a face shield or goggles. Because, you know, that way the teacher is, is optimally protected against any type of respiratory secretion exposure. Um, and they don't need gowns, but, you know, but if they're wearing a face covering and eye covering, then they can have those interactions and they're protected. And if you're saying, well, how is that possible? Keep in mind that in healthcare, healthcare providers are intentionally seeing people with COVID, with super bad COVID. And all they're doing is what I'm describing, and they are not getting sick. So obviously it works. If it can work in that setting, it can work in this setting. The real issue is people have to change their behavior. You have to rigorously wear protection. You have to rigorously distance yourself from students. You can't push a kid away who wants to hug you, but if you've got, a, if you've got eye covering and a mask on, it won't matter, but you don't want them to linger. And then you can actually be protecting your, your adults, mitigating harm, and, um, and recognizing that you're doing the best you can for the youngsters, but it's not going to be perfect. Because it can't and, and I mentioned this at the, the VACL board meeting, and I've been wanting to mention it here. You're going to have to make a decision as, as an entity about the level of risk you are willing to entertain. If you are about mitigation and creating an environment with negligible risk, it's completely doable. If your goal is zero risk, it is unattainable and you'll never reopen. Even with vaccine, you'll never reopen your schools because not everyone's going to get vaccinated. This disease is not going to go away for a long, long time. You're looking at many, many years of no school. Well, okay, online, if you call that. So you have online education. I'm not sure you have online learning. But, but the point being that you have to be overt about your presumption. You also, I believe, have to be overt about are you only focused on the risk within the school boundaries or also within the community that you serve? Because you alluded to this earlier, there are community level harms created by everything we are doing. And at some point, you are exacerbating far more than you are ameliorating. And you know, I, it, it's not my place to tell you what to do, so I won't, but I will give you an observation, which is that we have a 15% unemployment rate. And it would be far, far worse if it weren't for the fact that we have unemployment insurance providing some support to most of those people. When, when that goes away, not if, when that goes away, we're going to see a substantial impact with regard to the, to the usual harms of poverty on that population. And most businesses have cut 
parents a break since um, May. They've said, you know what, you can telework from home because I know you got to do the childcare thing. That's going to go away. Businesses can't survive that way. Some can. IT can do telework all the time, but most business sectors, that's been, you know, it's been a compromise that was expected to be in, of short duration. So more and more and more parents are going to start actually losing their job. And that's an impact on your community. Now, you don't have any choice in this right now. With the governor's, the, the governor's edict, you have no choice. And I'm not suggesting otherwise. I'm just offering to you that if you see yourself only as a school, you can have different presumptions and different behaviors than if you see yourself as a member of the community. Thank you so much for that input. Um, we just have one more question that involves you. And, uh, <laughs> man, um, and really what this has to do with our is with a, our five-phase continuum that we've set up as a district. And those five phases run us from, um, from phase one being completely at home, which is how we're going to start school on August 19th, to phase five being completely normal. With no, with, with no precautions being taken at school. And three phases in the middle. Phase two, 25% of our students or less at school at one time. Phase three, 50% or less of our students at school at one time. And phase four, which is 100% of our students at school, but with precaution. Um, so those are our five phases. Um, we have a number of things that, that come into play and that five phase continuum is actually gonna be released publicly very soon um, so that people can see all of the details of that. But one of the things that people are asking is, what is it that determines how we move from phase one to phase two or two to three or three back to two or whatever it is? And, and what we've told people is that there's a few different things that input in that. Uh, some of it is uh, the availability of staff to be able to run our school. The available, um, uh, but one of those things, obviously, is uh, laws and rules that are passed down by the state level, um, regulations that are coming from our um, our medical community, and we'll be relying a lot on our county public health department to help us determine whether it's right for us to move from one phase to another. Could you just give us um, an idea within those different phases of what your input might be? Um, when it comes to coming to you and saying, should we move to phase two out of phase one? Um, it's going to start by you being explicit with your presumption. If you're interested in mitigation and negligible risk, I'll give you different answers than if you want to have zero risk. I mean, so you have to be clear about what your goal is. Um, the problem is that your school environment has its own dynamics for disease transfer that are very different from the community. And the metrics that permit you to operate by the governor are based on community transfer. So they essentially have no correlation with what the risk would be were you to reopen. The considerations I would suggest are, if your goal is to minimize transmission within the classroom, then you need to think about a spacing that is appropriate. And that should determine the number of kids that can return, not 25, 50, 100. That's totally arbitrary and has absolutely nothing to do with disease. If you determine that in a typical room that has been housing 30 students, you can at most put 12, that's the percentage that can come back and maintain social distancing. So I would phase it as space for social distancing, not space for social distancing, because we're beyond worrying about it. We're willing to have full class load. And then really, it's just two steps. The teachers and the, the staff should always be optimally protected, no questions asked. So the, the density of students should have zero impact on their risk. If you have fearful families offering as a hybrid the opportunity for online is great because they're willing to do what it takes to educate their kids at home, more power to them. And then that is a control on who the percentage are that can come back. If more want to come back than you can allow for with social distancing, then you need a lottery. You see what I'm saying? I mean, if you do it based on the actual transmission risk of the disease, you have a slightly different staging that you would employ. Um, and then the problem is, unless we get local control to make those decisions, we're beholden to the governor, and the governor is not, is not looking at this at the level of subtlety necessary to be focused on the school environment separate from the 
And it's not his fault. He's not an epidemiologist. He's being informed by people who are who are getting all kinds of political pressure. I mean, the, it is really hard to understand all the pressure they're under to make these decisions. And so I don't fault them for what they're doing. They're doing the best they can. Nothing is being done with malevolence. Um, but it trumps anything we get to do. I mean, they overrule us. So you know, if they are going to require community metrics, we're going to have to have community metrics. And I, I'm going to be honest with you, with the current metrics, we're not looking good for a long time. I do have a question because athletics is one thing, another thing that um, people are, we had started some athletic conditioning. And um, after the governor's mandate, we stopped. Is that still a gray area? Because I know CIF came out with a different message saying that could continue. Um, Everything starts with your presumption. If you're pro sports, you're going to accept way more risk than if you're not. Right? I mean, Think about what you're asking. Within athletics, it's not uniform. Conditioning can be done with physical distancing. Swimming in lanes of your own can be done with physical distancing. Archery can done, be done with physical distancing. Golf can be done. Football, sorry, but it's a contact sport. There's no such thing as physical distancing unless you're a really lousy football player. <laughs> in, in which case, the only reason there's no contact is because you're still back at the, at the you know, line of scrimmage and everybody else is downfield. So the, the real issue here is you, you can't have it both ways. Either you're genuinely concerned about transmission and then team sports are the last thing to resume, or you're willing to take certain risks and then you should take those risks across the board because frankly, inhibiting academic education while maintaining physical education doesn't really seem like you know the model of the Renaissance. So I, you know, I, I don't know what's gonna happen because the rules of the game are not controlled at our level. And honestly, if you have a powerful lobby, then they can convince the governor to carve out an exception that is completely different from everything else. So you may actually have team sports back before you're even allowed to have face-to-face -face education, just based on the strength of that lobby. Yeah, because I know there's a waiver also. There's, you know, like we yeah. talked about, there's a loophole. And so I know some um, charter schools and private schools are planning, obviously, to submit a waiver to you for well, actually, in person. I'm not sure that the jury's out on whether the governor can tell them what to do at all. They're private. So there's even, I mean, it starts there, just as does the governor even have a legal right to close a church? I mean, some of these things that are happening do have legal implications that are not resolved. So it's possible that you will see um, your colleagues in private and charter schools operating and you're not. And they'll call it a waiver to look good politically, but it'll probably be because they had never had the right to close them. That was probably not a <laughs> well, I tell you, I, I hate to let you go, Dr. Matches, because I think the, the meeting's going to get a whole lot less interesting when you do. <laughs> but it's been so helpful for us to hear from you uh, in this way. Uh, if you'd like to stay, we'd love to have you stay and, and, and uh, feel free to jump in and, and answer questions or add to these answers. But if you need to go, I apologize. Um, I've got I've got a meeting. I got to get back. To. I'm sure you uh, do. <laughs> so, thank you but so I, I much for awesome being with us. We appreciate it. All right, and now, so there may be a little less interesting answers, unfortunately, but um, but hopefully no less informative and important uh, to what we're trying to do. Um, Angie Avlanitis, how are you? Yeah, thanks for that lovely intro, Tim. <laughs> um, Angie uh, is, has been our uh, Director of Student Services uh, for a number of years, uh, but in this environment, uh, she has been moved into um, a position Executive Director um, over COVID operations. And, and this is... Uh, a really important position for us uh, to be able to organize the work that we're doing during this time. Some are dubbing her the COVID queen as a result. Um, I don't know if she likes that or not, but I put it out there publicly, so there it is. Um, so we have a number of questions for you, Angie, that I'd, I'd like you to chime in on. Um, number one is, are we requiring a waiver when we return in person? Can parents sign a waiver to allow their children to attend school like normal. So the, the waiver I think we're talking about is, is some sort of waiver of liability if a student were to get sick. 
Sure, great question. At this point, as we know, the decision to have our children attend school has been made and is being made by our governor. And the criteria he has established to mandate that we be on distance learning while our county remains on the monitoring list. So as such, Tim, um, there is no such waiver. Thank you. And will FSUSD have uh, quarantine holding rooms at each site for students with suspected COVID-19 until parents can pick them up uh, so that they're away from other students and staff? Absolutely, every site will have a designated quarantine room or office space where students or staff will remain until they trans transported home safely. I think what's it, I'm, I'm just Go gonna ahead. say, I think what's important about that is staff may utilize that space more so than children because you know what our public health officer was saying, many of our children may be asymptomatic. And so we may not even know that they're sick, but I think it's important that we have this space because we do need it for probably more staff. This big question, will the district provide math for students and staff? So I think as Dr. Matias just explained, um, you know, people really should have face coverings when they leave their home for school or work. Um, but to that end, face coverings will be made available for our students and staff on request. In fact, we have um, purchased close to a half a million dollars worth of personal protective equipment. And that's in addition to all of the um, face masks, face coverings, um, disinfectant, hand sanitizers that we also received um, through some additional funds from the state. And do we have enough staff to do a wellness check every morning with all staff and students? Sure, so we are in the process of hiring eight additional licensed vocational nurses, otherwise referred to as LVN, so that each site will have their own designated health professional. But again, I think like Dr. Matias um, shared this morning, it's going to be really important to work with individuals to do individual health screenings, but I look forward to collaborating with our school nurses to do a self-screening um, list for our staff. What training will staff have regarding infectious disease control? So we do have guidance that, receive, that we've received from the California Department of Public Health, as well as the State of California Department of Industrial Relations, otherwise known as OSHA. And we're currently reviewing these guidelines and considerations for school and school-based programs and are putting together um, training for all of our staff related to guidance. Okay. Will, will masking be mandatory for everyone when we come back to school? And if not, why not? Sure. So especially as we're looking at phases two to four, face coverings are required to be properly worn by everyone on school grounds at all times. If you listen to Governor Newsom's press conference last Friday, students in grades um, third grade and above are required to wear a face mask or face covering. While our students in second grade and below are strongly encouraged to wear a face covering, um, our students and staff with medical exemptions will not be required to wear face coverings. One of the issues that um, has come up in regards to face coverings um, it's, is that, particularly in the younger grade, it's important for students to see their teacher's mouth as they are learning to read and. Um, articulating sounds and different things like that. And so we have purchased, um, and actually one of our teachers sent this uh, idea to me a couple months ago, and we were able to act on this, but um, there are ma masks that uh, cover your face, but they're clear. And so we have purchased, I believe, 3,000 of them. Does that number sound about it's a it's a, a large amount that we have um, that we've provided and or that we have for our, our primary team. Seventy five hundred. Thank you. And Ken, if you would like, we'd love to have you join uh, the dais when you get a chance. Um, our next question is for Dan Mitchell, who's our child nutrition services director. Um, Dan, a lot of people want to know. How will lunch be coordinated to ensure proper social distancing is maintained? 
Okay, well, uh, child nutrition will have additional lunch periods uh, to allow for social distancing. In addition, we, we have received a waiver from the state that will allow the teachers of the classrooms to fill out a roster prior to the students coming to the cafeteria. That way they don't have to enter numbers into the keypad um, and they won't even have to stop at the point of service. So that'll allow for better social distancing as well. At the secondary levels, they'll be able to use their ID card and scan their number into the system so that it'll, uh, they won't have to be touching the services. Great, thank you. And I, I know we're gonna have some other questions for you um, in the future, so stand by. Um, and Ken, the next uh, set of questions is for you. Ken is our um, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. And uh, the first question for you, Ken, is if teachers are exposed, are they allowed to quarantine for 14 days to safeguard their health as well as the health of their family and still receive pay? That is uh, following state, uh, state and federal mandates that there is emergency uh, COVID leave that yes, they would be paid during that 10 day period and we would follow all laws and statutes to make sure that's taken care of. Great, and if a teacher is exposed to COVID and must quarantine for 14 days, will that teacher actually be paid for those 14 days or will those, will those days um, come out of their regular sick leave? Again, and that, would, that answer would go uh, with the previous answer that because of the COVID leave uh, and the emergency COVID leave that is there, they would be covered for that during that time period. What is the plan, Ken, for school sites? Um, should multiple teachers end up out sick with COVID-19 and there aren't enough substitutes to replace them? Uh, well, we would, what we would do is we would pool our resources to make sure that if on the stages two through four, we would make sure that we had enough people to cover those classrooms and follow all our contractual guidelines to make sure that's done. But we would pool our resources and we would go at that school to make, uh, that school or schools to make sure that they had the needed staff to cover those, uh, cover their needs. I also want to mention that d d with the governor's mandate, even in-person in instruction, there are certain guidelines. And so if, if a set amount of staff or students um, is ill, then there are guidelines uh, as to when we'll close down that school and or even a classroom. And so we'll have to follow those guidelines as well. Uh, Ken, when is the district going to find funds if needed for extra uh, PPE, uh, protection equipment, um, or staff if needed in phases two, three, if we're short on, in staff? These, um, these funds have already been allotted to or are coming to the district through the CARE funding. Uh, some of that would be reimbursed through FEMA reimbursements that have been uh, offered to the districts to, to uh, have these materials. Many of the materials also are being provided, also provided by the state. Those, those materials are currently in our warehouse. So we already have a large, as stated earlier by the superintendent, there's already a large contingent of those materials already in our warehouse ready to be distributed out, but those those funds, were, they come from the, the care funding that came in and they're also coming from FEMA reimbursement. Okay, thank you. And I know you're answering this question for uh, Michelle, um, and I thank you for standing in on her behalf for this one. How will transportation to and from school be provided in phases two through four? Well, depending, first off, identifying which students would need transportation on each day, day, we would work with the transportation department that has an outstanding and putting the routes together. So we would work with them on a daily basis to make sure that we met the transportation needs of our students through the routing process. We'd first have to identify which students needed that transportation on those days, and then we would work it out through that to make sure everybody was proper. Great, thank you, Ken. Our next question is for Liz Teresi, our Acting Director of Student Services. Liz, if parents send their students to school sick, how will schools respond? Schools will immediately try to get in touch with the family to come pick the child up, pick the child up and take them home, and then got, ask them to follow up with their health care provider. If the family cannot come immediately to pick up the student, they'll stay in the quarantine room until they are able to so. Thank you, Liz. 
Next few questions are for uh, Paul, Executive Director of Facilities. Paul Speed, thank you uh, for coming to the podium. Paul, how are the schools going to ensure the kids in restrooms will comply with safety guidelines and avoid exposure? Well, Tim, when we move into phase two, the district will limit access to every other stall and urinal in the restrooms, and we'll make adjustments as we progress through higher. Will round classroom ta tables be replaced with regular desks, or will plastic shields be added? Uh, the district's going to utilize the current furniture, and we'll space students accordingly based on the phase that we're at. During phase two and beyond, will there be additional hand washing stations provided on campus? I think this question also kind of applies to those classrooms that don't have sinks in them already. Yes, so the district will provide adequate soap and paper towels in the classrooms that do have sinks. And for classrooms that don't have sinks, hand sanitizing stations will be available in each one of those. I think additionally, even those um, classrooms that do have sinks, we have enough hand sanitizer that we will have a hand sanitizer available in all classrooms, regardless of whether or not they have sinks. Yes, yeah. Great, thank you, Paul. And this is the last question for you. Uh, how will water be provided to children since water fountains won't be accessible? Uh, we do have hydration stations available at um, most sites. Uh, for those that don't have hydration stations, those students would be encouraged to bring their own personal water bottles <clears throat> from home. Um, and so. I, I think it's a teaching moment, too, because if you listen to Dr. Mike, use the water fountain. And so if you're using the water fountain to fill a water bottle, that's very different than if you're using the water fountain to put your mouth on and, and have that supply book. Yes. And I think it's important to point out, too, that um, those hydration stations are, are different than, than water fountains in that there's less, if no chance, of, of uh, saliva getting transmitted when you're filling up from a hydration station that goes directly to the bottle. Right. Great. Uh, the next question is for Ryan. Ryan's our new uh, director of elementary education. Welcome. Uh, to the district, and uh, we're glad you're here with us. Ryan, um, how would distance learning work for kids entering into uh, TK or transitional kindergarten? Thank you for that question. Similar to students in other grade levels, our TK students will receive rigorous distance learning instruction, which will consist of synchronous or in-person instruction, as well as asynchronous instruction. Enrichment opportunities will be provided for our students in TK, as in the other grades, as well as for students who needed intervention support. I just want to correct something, because I think you meant in real time, not in-person instruction, right? That's correct. Yeah. My apologies. Synchronous instruction in real time. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you. The next question, next two questions, is for Sheila McCabe, our Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services. Sheila. What would be the class sizes in each phase, and how would you maintain social distancing? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Gorey. It actually it was very interesting to hear the response from our official from Solano County Public Health regarding this matter. And when we went through and looked at the class sizes and made those determinations of the 25% and 50%, so in essence, in phase two, we anticipate there would be approximately 25% of the students would be in the class. In, in that case, we would have somewhere between six to nine students in every classroom, and we're able to set up the classrooms where they would be six feet apart between students, as well as six feet apart between the students and the staff. In phase um, three, sorry, I'm trying to also remember the phases in my brain. In phase three, there would be approximately 12 to 18 students per class. And in phase three, we would not be able to maintain six feet between the students. Those, those desks would have to be closer, but we would be able to maintain the six feet from the group of students that are closer together than six feet, and then having a six foot space between those, those set of desks and um, the space al allowed for the teacher, allocated for the teacher. And then in phase four, there wouldn't be um, that kind of social distancing or physical distancing within the classroom itself. 
Um, and so we do, in some ways, we have accounted for what, what he was talking about in terms of those distancing, physical distancing, where it would be six feet between everybody in phase two, six feet between the group of students and the staff in phase three, and then um, no social distance, no significant social distancing in phase four. Thank you. Once school is open, will clear masks be provided for staff um, or teachers that work with deaf students? Yeah, in fact, the superintendent, Corey, was talking about when um, the teacher, I, I think it was like May or early June when the teacher sent us the mask saying, How, hey, have you seen these? Um, we immediately jumped on trying to secure those masks because we think that there are a number of ways in which that kind of a mask will be very beneficial and, and one of them will also be in, in able to support our children who are deaf require being able to see the mouth in order to communicate. Uh, Angie, next question is for you. Will parents be given an adequate amount of time to prepare if and when the district decides to change phases? Sure, so um, as mentioned earlier with our doctor from public health, a decision to move in or out of a phase uh, will be made in consultation with Solano um, Public Health and depending on guidance from the governor. Um, but as such, we would provide adequate time for families and for our staff to prepare to move to phases. I'm gonna add to that because one of the things that we heard not only from our parents, but also from our association is that they want to, have a set time, amount of time, before moving into phases. And so our goal is from August 19th until we'll revisit it in October to see then if we're gonna do another uh, quarter of distance learning. And so, because we know that people have to plan and it just, it, it will be too problematic if we say, oh, within, you know, two weeks, we're gonna all of a sudden turn around. So. We are set right now for certain to go through um, the first part of October in distance learning when it will be reevaluated. Should miraculously things change in Solano County and we get off the watch list. Yeah, and that date, that exact date is October 16th that we've um, uh, committed to doing phase one through. And October 8th is the board meeting in which the board will get the information and make a decision as to whether or not to change. So there, there should be some decent lead time there for people to prepare. And even if they choose to change, they may not decide to change on October 19th, or the Monday after that. They may push it out. Uh, Ken, back at the uh, podium, if schools don't open, will child nutrition staff be laid off? That's a good question. Um, with the passing of Senate Bill 98, uh, which provided funding for schools, uh, it is not allowable uh, to lay off people in that classification. And it is also extended to bus drivers and um, our custodial staff. And, and to add to that, we continuously work with our uh, CSEA labor partners to address all, all areas of need in the classified area. But those are, by the passage of that bill, it is not allowed. And what's important to note is that we're still going to be required to serve lunch to our students. And so, um, we have put in a waiver to see what that would look like if we can continue to do what we've done um, since the closures, which was uh, like a summer seamless feeding program. But we are going to need our, our cafeteria workers and our food service workers because we anticipate that um, there will be a lot of kids who will need to eat breakfast and lunch, even during distance learning. Thank you, Ken. Kristen, our Director of Secondary Education, this question is for you. How will grading work? And what happens if a child starts to struggle academically, especially in high school? Uh, good morning, Tim, and it's a great question. And for those of you that were here with us spring semester, you're familiar with what we named Hold Harmless for grades. That will not continue um, as we begin the new school year. So students will be accountable uh, for work completion and assessments in each of their courses during all five phases of our continuum. Teachers grading policies will be in alignment with our board policy 5121 and administrative regulation 5121. And each school will identify structures um, of support for any students that are struggling. 
And we do recognize that the distance learning format will pose additional challenges for, for different students. And as such, schools will design and align structures of support for their students. Those structures and supports will be communicated to both staff, families, and students, so they're aware of how to access them if need. Thank you. And the next question is, is for Ryan, although it may apply in, in other cases as well. Um, will there be special support given to students who are entering a new school for the very first time during phases one through four, but I think particularly phase one, I think a lot of people are thinking, what about my kindergartner, right? That's a great question. So for students who are entering school for the first time, communication will be shared with site administration and staff, the families, so that way they have all the information that they need. Um, and it's important to note too for our students that social emotional learning will continue to be a strong focus this year, regardless of which phase we are in. Great, and Kristen, do you have anything you might wanna add as far as getting into high school for the first time or junior high, I mean, middle school? Yeah, you know, and it, it's important to note that a lot of the schools are actually working on messaging for families and students through video recordings. And so even at the end um, with spring, as we were in our distance learning format, uh, many administrators um, recognize the ability to communicate with their incoming grade levels through video platforms so that they could go through all of the different attributes of what students needed to, need, um, to know. And so they're working on that as well as a component to um, outline some of the, the pieces that maybe an incoming ninth grader into high school really needs to know before they start. Great, thank you. And Brian and Kristen both may have input to this, uh, to the answer for this question. Will the district um, release class lists in advance so that parents can organize kids into social learning pods outside of the classroom? I'm gonna answer this in two ways. Um, one, just in general, we do have our administrative staff returning both this week and next week, and so all administrators will be back by the end of next week. They did start their master schedules in both elementary and secondary prior to leaving for summer break. They do need some time to make some refinement and adjustment when they come back. As soon as those lists and classes are developed, though, that will be communicated out to both students and families. Um, there will not be an expectation on teachers to start communicating back to families if they're contacted prior to their first official workday as a teacher. However, if a teacher wanted to communicate back with a family prior to their first workday, that would be amazing. Um, and with what Dr. Matias said earlier about, you know, <clears throat> socializing outside of the school, this question is interesting to me because it almost lends itself for us to encourage families to not gather in those pod settings unless they're safely social distancing. And so I just felt it important to add that based on what the doctor said earlier. Do you have anything to add, Ryan, or is that pretty much the same for elementary? Yeah, pretty much the same thing with regards to the elementary administrators are developing their plans to fully communicate out to families, uh, their child's teacher for the year, and they're developing ways to go about that in a variety of formats. And I think this is gonna be a change of practice because many of, particularly at the elementary, the big deal was, you know, the day or the Friday before school starts was when the classes would be released. And we have um, teachers right now who are reaching out at the elementary level saying, I want my class list and I want it now. <laughs> um, and so we do want to get those lists out earlier, but I just want to reiterate, there's no expectation on teachers' part to reach out, you know, prior to their official work, first work day, which is August 7th. In phases two and three, how will it be determined what kids go to school and what day or time that they go to school at? Uh, this is for Kristen or Ryan. So um, similar to our previous question, each school site administrative team is developing their cohorts of students. Um, that information will be shared. And if you think of it in terms of that cohort will remain consistent for the entire school year, whether we're in phase one or phase five. And so it provides that ability for a staff to say, okay, this cohort is developed. Now, when we look at phase two, this is the structure for the days of the week in terms of the 25% grouping that will attend. And that information will be shared with families when that's developed in advance. And families and staff would all, and students would also then know once we move to phase three, these are the students that then join together from two different cohorts or, or that 50%, I should say, actually from that one cohort together for phase three. And then phase four, obviously, all the students coming back together. In the secondary world, um, students would maintain their structure of their six courses. 
um, if there's a situation where students have seven courses, that would be built into their cohort. And, and so students will have a consistent group that they're remaining with um, all the way through each of the different phases of the continuum. And I'd like to add at the elementary level as well to what Kristen just shared, um, there will be a lot of care taken to ensure that siblings on different grade levels are within the similar cohorts on those days, which will allow for consistency for families when uh, the students are one on campus, when we get to those phases for in-person instruction, and two, when they're at home with distance learning. Hey, thank you. And I think that question answered the next question. So I'm going to skip to the question after that and uh, bring up Chris Clark, our uh, Director of Technology Support Services, uh, for three questions. Chris, the first question is, can teachers provide instruction via Zoom? Thanks, Tim. Um, the answer is no. District's going to continue to use Google Meet as our preferred platform of instruction as desired by the Education Services Department to simplify the delivery of instruction uh, to students through a single platform. So it's also important uh, to note that students are going to be moving away from their free uh, offering that they have currently. And at current cost, it's about $90 a teacher a year. Thank you. And the second one, second question is, will devices be provided for all students? And what if a home has no internet access? What happens? Great question. So we will continue to provide iPads and Chromebooks to all students. Uh, for homes that don't have internet access, we work with uh, CDE and Google on an offering where they provide hotspots for families. So we've shared those students that do not have internet access. All right. And uh, I think the next question was really about Wi-Fi. So I think uh, you've already answered that question that we're providing that on, a, on an as-needed basis. Correct. Thank you. I think uh, it's important to note, too, that there are many, nights, there are many programs that are um, very low in cost for our families as well for Wi-Fi. And so, um, but some people, as we know, $10 a month is even a stretch. And so that's where we have our hotspots made available. That's correct. Comcast does have a low budget option that's available for families in need. Yep. And how to sign up for those low budget options um, are is on our website on our Start of School COVID uh, 19 page. On the top right hand side, there's a link that takes you to all the options available in our area. And some people would say, well, if the district's going to give it to me for free, why would I want to pay $10 a month for it? Well, the one that we're giving for free <laughs> is a cell based option. The one that you would get if you paid $10 a month for it is a much faster, much better service. And so, um, you know, in that sense, if you can afford the $10 a month, it's much better to have that, that class of Internet access. Thank you, Chris. Um, Dorothy, our Director of Special Education, the next question is for you. Dorothy, can yes. students with IEPs return to school while everyone else um, stays online? So while we're on the watch list, all students, including students with IEPs, will remain on distance learning until we're given permission to move toward phase, phase one, phase two. <laughs> I, yeah, I did want to uh, add to that because, as I mentioned, there is some guideline. There are some guidelines out for waivers. Um, and so we just have to wait for more guidance because there may be instances, even in phase one, where we'll be able to bring small groups of students back for in-person instruction. And so we just have to um, you know, wait for that guidance. But as of this point in time right now, all students are doing distance. We do hope to do some assessing. We are going to need to do that to share students. Great, thank you. Uh, Howard Kornblum, our uh, Director of English Language Services, Instructional Services, thank you for being with us today. This question is for you. It says, will there be resources like online tutoring to help with the student, to help the students with subjects that parents themselves are either unfamiliar or uncomfortable with? Uh, thanks for that question, Tim. Uh, yes, online tutoring resources will be made available for parents and students. The district is also working on developing a menu of additional research-based targeted interventions to provide student support as well. 
Thank you. Next question is for Liz, you know, Acting Director of Student Services. <laughs> Liz, will attendance be taken during distance learning? Absolutely, and unless we receive new guidance from the state, it will be focused around student engagement. So teachers will need to keep a weekly log of engagement items, and that's how attendance will be tracked. Thank you, Liz. We have just a few minutes, but I'm trying to get as many as we can, in, and we finally reached Melissa. And we've had her up here this entire time, but some of these questions are so important, and what Melissa and her department does in, in our district is so important. I'm glad we can get to these. In the distance learning format, will teachers be required to teach material via a live video call or by sending a pre-recorded video of them teaching the lesson? And will teachers be available for questions? So the governor and the California Department of Education have both indicated that any distance learning plan will need to include live virtual instruction for every single student every single day. So the answer is yes. Um, additionally, teachers will be available for questions. We, we anticipate building that into the plan. Thank you. And how much time will, um, will a student and the teacher need to be on the computer every day? Good question. We are actually still in the process of a cons confirming the exact structure of the distance learning plan. However, when we do come forward with that information, it will out outline the specific amounts of times for that live virtual instruction every day. I think the one piece that will be really important for our families to understand, and this came, um, if you listen to the press conference from the governor in particular on Friday, that the, what is being provided this fall has to be substantially more rigorous than what took place in the spring. And so there is an expectation that there is going to be much more synchronous or um, live, not necessarily in person, but live instruction that's taking place daily with much more rigorous assignments and accountability for those assignments than what we saw in the fall. So I think, or in spring, excuse me. So I think that's the big piece in terms of the difference with the distance learning and how much time we're a student. And we heard some examples of um, from the springtime where some students received very little work and other examples where it was um, an excessive amount of work. And so part of the professional development that will be taking place this between now and when school starts and then also work at the school sites is to ensure that it's more rigorous without becoming that excessive piece that we saw in, in some circumstances. Superintendent Corey, this is a time check. It's 1031. Uh, do you want to continue uh, or would I, you like to cut it off? I think we can continue. We have uh, a few more questions left that I think are really important for our community to know. So I think that as we record, people may be able to fast forward through some of this, <laughs> but um, I think that there are some other questions. So I think we can go another 15, 20 minutes. Um, we understand those of you that are here in person, if that's a uh, time constraint for you. Um, just know that we're going to be publishing this via social media tonight. So thank you all for being here in person, but go ahead, Mr. Corey. Great, thank you. Uh, Melissa, with 100% distance learning, is there a way that our children can get books that go along with what they're learning? Now, this question comes from a parent who's also really concerned that they have books available because they're not always sure how to get access to those electronic resources so they can help the child. Um, so there's lots of things built into just those two little simple questions. <laughs> um, we are working to ensure that students have digital access to all of their instructional materials. We do also have consumable materials um, and any materials that are not available online will be provided um, for all students. And that's regardless of what phase we're in. Um, all students will have the materials they need to be successful. We also know that distance learning um, has had an impact on some families in terms of being able to know how to support their students in school. And so we're really right now working to develop some video and then virtual drop-in supports for parents and families to be able to help their students. So um, resources to be able to know how to access digital resources their students um, are using, but then also how to help with some of the the schoolwork tasks that they might be um, asked to support at home on independent time. 
if you choose for your child not to return, um, if, the re if the decision at some point is to return ba back to a hybrid model, phase two or above, um, and they choose to do that as a health and safety concern, can you elect distance learning within your enrolled school and decline enrolling in virtual academy? Not at this time. Right now, a family could guarantee their spot in the virtual academy by July 31st. And after that date, there will be a wait list and space will be on a, on a space availability basis. However, um, the phased plan doesn't allow for some to remain on distance learning while others are still in school full, or at any portion of time. Will students be allowed screen time break during class? Best practice indicates that screen time breaks are incorporated throughout the day for students and for staff. Yep. How will teachers be able to provide in-class instruction to a percentage of the class and at the same time provide virtual instruction to the other percentage of students during phases two and three? Really good question. We're still in the process again of confirming how that structure is gonna work. So while we're developing the distance learning plan, it's not just for the 100% distance learning, it also will address phases, the return for phases two and for phase three. Um, we do know though that, that that requirement from the governor will include live in-person inst or live instruction for all students, whether they are in person or participating in distance learning. So that's something that we will have to work out how that will happen um, when we do enter into phase two and phase three. Now I'm gonna to move to a question for uh, Dr. Sheila McCabe. Um, and this question is, will school start times be the same for all phases? At this time, we don't see making any adjustments to our school start times. And so I don't believe that that's going to change. What we may see though, so I guess there is a little bit of, of a caveat to that. In phase two, three, and four, there is gonna be a need to stagger when students are coming to school and, and really more so in phase three and phase four. I'm thinking of like at RMEO High School to have even um, 1,300 kids or 1,200 kids come to the campus at one time might not provide the staggering that we need. And so there might be some five minute or 10 minute staggering of time, but we don't see hour or two hour shifts in, in the start time. Thank you. And as an extension of that, there's been some confusion about the percentages um, referred to in phases two through four, 25, 50, 100 percent. Um, are those numbers of students on campus? Are they numbers of students in a classroom? Or are they a percentage of days that the students attend? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that there's lots of numbers with the word percentage after it. And so I can appreciate how that gets confusing to hear. In, I'll start with phase two. So in phase two, we anticipate that there would be approximately 25% of the students inside the each classroom, which would then mean also there's about 25% of the students that are on the campus. However, that where part of that confusion comes is so with them being there one day a week, 25% of the students on campus one day a week, they're receiving 20% of their instruction in person and 80% of their instruction through distance learning. In phase three, which is when we have 50% or approximately 50% of the students returning, we would have approximately 50% of the kids in every one of the classrooms, approximately 50% of the kids on campus. The students would be coming to school two days a week. And so that would mean that they would have 40% of their instruction in person and 60% of their instruction in distance learning. Thank you, that helped. Dorothy, yes. Director of Special Education, two questions for you. How will students with IEPs, learning disabilities, or in TAP classes be supported during this time? All IEPs will be reviewed to determine distance learning services. In addition, any related services that are listed on the IEP will be provided. And what will you be doing for preschoolers? You, I mean us as school <laughs> districts. What will the district be doing for preschoolers, especially those enrolled in special programs, 
such as RISE, that not only focus on speech therapy, but on social interaction between students. So we'll have our preschool teachers also review the IEPs and determine opportunities that would be available to provide student interaction while, preventing, while presenting instruction during um, distance learning. Thank you. Howard Kornblum, two more questions for you. If we choose distance learning for a dual immersion student who is in eighth grade, will they be able to earn their certificate? So just to clarify, all of our district will be on district distance learning next year, currently. Now, if they're in the virtual academy, that's a different question than distance learning. So if they are uh, completing their dual immersion program through distance learning, as a Beagle Wilson student, they will earn their certificate of completion. Great, and what if uh, a child has problems focusing in the virtual classroom? So if a child is struggling with virtual instruction, then would definitely suggest to reach out to their classroom teacher to discuss the challenges. Um, teachers also, uh, what we've done in the past has included some office hours through our distance learning model. And so that's a great time for uh, parents and students to check in with one another. And if the struggle still persists, then I would highly suggest that the parent contact the site administrator for additional discussion. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. Kristen, we, we touched on this a little bit earlier with Dr. Matches, but maybe there's some more specifics that you can give. What are high school sports and band going to look like during the, these phases, and can any sports actually occur right now? Thank you, Tim. And yes, Dr. Matches did touch on this. And so currently right now, athletic conditioning and band conditioning cannot occur um, in Solana County per Solana County Public Health Directive. Um, on July 20th, the CIS, so California Interscholastic Federation, did come out with their amended guidelines for the seasons of play for the 2020-2021 school year. And in a typical school year, we have three seasons for sports. It goes fall, winter, spring. Um, the modified seasons for the 2021 school year would be reduced from three seasons to two. There would be one fall season and one spring season, with the majority of the sports falling in the spring season. Um, the Sac Joaquin section, which is what Fairfield Sassoon is part of, also met um, and reviewed the CIF guidelines and are adhering to all of the CIF guidelines and have developed the calendar um, for those two seasons of play, the, the fall and the spring. Um, if we have clearance from Solano County Public Health at the time, our fall season would commence December 7th, 2020. Again, it's very important to note that's pending approval from Solano County Public Health at that time. In terms of band, um, we are still working with the band director um, and different organizations to review what band and choir and music instruction will look like for the 2021 school year. I, I think it's very important to note for both staff, parents, and families that it will look different. Um, so what we have known band and music instruction to look like previously will not be the same moving forward. And it's important for everyone to know that when we have more specifics of what it actually will entail and what it will look like that will be shared. And that is being developed in, in communication and collaboration with our band director. And how will early college high school be affected by the different phases? So early college high school, like all schools in our district, will adhere to the different phases of the five phase continuum. However, early college is unique in the sense that it's partnered with courses on the community college's campus. And so this uniqueness uh, brings an opportunity for um, some potential memorandums of understanding that might need to be written that are unique to early college. And therefore, the principal of early college will be joining uh, the bargaining table to discuss any potential memorandums of understanding that would pertain specifically to early college. How might COVID-19 affect seniors? And what will happen with uh, events like senior pictures? So seniors will participate in the current phase that we're in, just like every other student in FSUSD. Placement on the continuum, and this has been said before in different venues during our board meetings, it is fluid. So it is possible that a student at one school, their school, 
um, might be in one phase or a different school's in another. So wherever that student is attending, wherever that senior is, whatever high school program they're in, they would be within that phase for that school within their cohort at that time. In terms of senior pictures, um, that is not something that we have broached the topic yet to determine specifically what those will look like. That will be coordinated, and when we have that information, that will be shared out with both students and families. Thank you. And how will phase one or two affect uh, the IB program in high school? I think it's really important to note that students that are in the IB program are still enrolled in all of their IB courses. And it, regardless of the phase that we're in, there is no negative impact to students in the IB program. And if I can just add, so one of the things we saw in the spring is that actually International Baccalaureate also came out with guidelines to accommodate schools that were in a distance learning format. And I'm, I would be surprised if IB did not do the same thing again this year if there's lots of schools that are in distance learning or some kind of hybrid phase. Correct. Will high school students have a block schedule? Um, and if so, what is the length of each class? This, I guess, would apply to any uh, phase two through four. Right. The, the only schools that are on block schedule are those that were previously on block schedule. So that's Rodriguez High School and Early College High School. And so their periods or length of time are exactly the same as they were. No other schools modified their schedules to go to block. We have time for one more question. I think that this one's important. So I'm going to go to um, Dan Mitchell because I think it's important for families to know how will meals and snacks be provided in the different phases? Well, in the different, in phase one, for example, we've requested a waiver from the state and we've been granted a waiver to actually design menus for five days worth of meals to be de delivered directly to the homes of those students. Uh, we're in the process of working with our vendors and developing a menu to make that happen. Uh, as far as phase two and three, where students are on the campus for a, a certain number of days. In phase two, I've requested a waiver, have not heard back on doing in-person meals on the days the students are on campus, and then still delivering four days worth of meals to the homes of the families. And then of course in phase three, they, we would deliver meals two days on campus, and then deliver another box with three meals in it to the families' homes. So I'm hoping to hear back from the state on those other two phases by the end of the month. But we're, like I said, we're currently in the process of designing menus and working with our vendors to make sure we have products available to make that happen. Thank you. I just want to thank everybody once again for tuning in. We didn't get to everybody's questions um, due to time constraints, but just like we did last time, all of the questions that are asked will be on a Q&A document. They will be published in both English and Spanish. And um, again, if you have questions that you have for one of us that wasn't answered or even in the Q&A after the fact and you didn't see your question, please do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, we want to be as transparent and clear and as helpful and supportive as possible during this, price, uh, during this crisis. And so, um, we wish you all to be safe and healthy, and we will see you virtually beginning August 19th. Thank you.